Dami i gospodo, sada prelazimo na prvi blok našeg današnjeg programa u kome ćemo čuti tri prezentacije. Imajte u vidu da pitanja za naše goste možete postavljati i na YouTube chatu. Mi ćemo to pažljivo pratiti kao i svaki put do sada i onda pitati naše govornike na Bini da daju odgovore na vaše pitanja. Prvo izlaganje u ovom segmentu imat će gospodin Andronikos Kiriaku iz kompanije Wellbone. Wellbone je cyber security kompanija koja štiti veliki broj operatorskih mreža od pretnji kao što su botneti, ransomware, spyware i phishing. Također, Wellbone je vodeći partner u projektu DNS for EU, odnosno for EU, koji nastoji da obezbedi sigurne DNS usluge za građane i firme u Evropskoj uniji. Danas će nam Andronikos pričati upravo na temu usluge DNS-a, uloge, pardon, DNS-a u cyber bezbednosti. Mr. Kiriaku, thank you for joining us live today in Belgrade. Please take the stage and you have 30 minutes. Please watch the time. Molim vas za jedan aplauz za gospodina Kiriakua. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, my name is Andronikos. I am leading the technical consulting team at Whalebone. Uh, before we begin, I would like to say a very warm thank you to the organizing team for inviting us here today. I am always very happy being in Belgrade. I love the food. Uh, so, today I would like to speak about DNS, about challenges, about opportunities we see, and how it has recently evolved in the last years. Uh, during the presentation, we will speak about traditional DNS, we will speak about DNSSEC, uh, we will speak about DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS, and then we will take a step further and we will speak about this new trend of protective DNS, right? One of these uh, cases of protective DNS is the project called DNS for EU. So I will also give you a short overview of what this is all about. Uh, a short overview of the company Whalebone. Uh, we are based in the Czech Republic in the city called Brno. And uh, basically in our core, we are doing DNS security. Uh, and we have recently also launched another layer of identity protection. Right now, we are approximately 80 people strong, and we have three different products. The first product is called Aura, which is mainly for telco operators. We have another product, Immunity, for uh, governments and independent organizations, and uh, another service, Peacemaker, for ISPs. So, uh, let's start from the ba very basics, right? Uh, when speaking about DNS, we should have a slide, what is DNS resolution? And uh, let's, ima let's imagine we have a user, who wants to visit uh, rsnog.rs and check the, the program of today's event. So they will go on their browser, they will go on Chrome, on Firefox, and they will type in uh, rsnog. Eventually, the browser or the operating system, what it will need to do, it will need to use a DNS resolver and translate this domain name to an IP address. Uh, I will speak a bit about the matching in the next slide, but eventually for the user, this is transparent. Yeah, they are able to go to this uh, website and check the program that they would like to see. So in the background, what is actually happening, the DNS resolver is going on a long path. He's starting from the root servers, he's going to the CCTLDs, and he's basically going around and trying to figure out where is this IP address. Uh, how to do it? Basically, all the authoritative servers there on the on the right, they tell it, I don't know, ask another one. Eventually, he finds a response, he's happy, he returns to the user. Now, we can all agree that DNS is a protocol, right? In order to do this process, even though it sounds simple, um, we have some set of rules and some set of standards we are following. So, DNS actually started as an unencrypted protocol. And um, this fact, the fact that we have a DNS resolver and an authoritative server, and we need to transfer some information, it has some issues. So let's say we have some malicious user, and uh, he's there in the middle. Um, now, when the original user who wanted to go to rsnog.rs tries to visit the website, some malicious attacker can actually tamper with information and send them to another conference. No, we don't want that. So uh, what we did is we introduced this uh, DNSSEC, right? What is DNSSEC? Is uh, some security extensions of the DNS protocol to ensure basically that the data we get from the authoritative are actually authentic. How do we do it? We sign the data and the resolver is able to validate that actually this information is valid, the authoritative really intended to return this information. 
So, great, we have solved the first challenge. Now, uh, we have all the information in our resolver. And let's take a step back, yeah? Let's, uh, let's consider from the perspective, when it all started, DNS resolvers used to be local. Yeah, they used to be in our local networks, easy to reach. But as the internet grew, and as the services went to the cloud, for better or worse, uh, the DNS resolvers also followed suit. So now, what we have is DNS resolvers running on the cloud, like Cloudflare, like Google DNS, and users starting to use them, right? There is a downside that they have to go over the internet to reach these services. And if you go over the internet and you have plain text information, then sometimes it can be easy to be tampered with. So we need some solution. We need somehow to find a way to protect also this last mile, this part from the user to the resolver. And the first way to do that, the first method we employed was this DNS over TLS. The idea is quite simple, so you have a DNS message and we do what we know to do best. When something is going on, on the internet, we encrypt. Right. So uh, we have the DNS message, we encapsulate it on a TS, TLS layer and then we send it over, we get back a response, everyone is happy. Now, DNS over TLS, when it was originally starting, uh, it used port 853, it's still using it. So if you are a network admin and would like to block access to DNS over TLS, you can really filter on port 853, block it, and then there is no DNS over TLS. So for the users, we need to find a better solution. We need to find some solution how we can blend in the DNS traffic into our normal web browsing behavior. So how to do that is actually uh, use DNS over HTTPS. What's the idea? What's the extension about? So we have our DNS message. We encapsulate it on an HTTP uh, layer. And then this HTTP layer, we put a TLS layer all around. So we have DNS and HTTPS. Uh, now everything actually blends in, right? DNS is using port 443. Your normal web traffic is using port 443. So there is no difference. Great. S sounds good. <laughs> so uh, we have the following problem now. We have resolvers uh, who are actually supporting DNS over TLS or DNS over HTTPS. They are there, they are on the cloud and the users need to somehow actually reach them. And we have this problem of uh, discoverability. The users cannot really find where these resolvers are. So what can we do? We can sit around, we can discuss it. There were actually several discussions in the past. And um, the ones who actually led this transformation and this started solving this problem of discoverability were the browsers. So starting in 2018, uh, we have Mozilla Firefox. And uh, Firefox, what they did in, in the US, they started their rollout of the automatic DNS over HTTPS enablement. What they did, they cooperated with uh, Cloudflare and NextDNS, and they called them trusted recursive resolvers. What does it mean? If you are a user in the US and you open Firefox, uh, you have this enable DNS over HTTPS. Can I point? Enable DNS over HTTPS, and uh, basically you have automatic upgrade. Now, from the network admin perspective, it can be the case that there are some other security policies on the network. And if DNS over HTTPS traffic is leaving the network, then there is a problem. So, uh, what Mozilla also introduced is this canary domain. What does it mean? Upon startup, Firefox is making a DNS request for a very particular DNS record. So it is asking for use application DNS.net. And if the answer is NX domain or serve fail, then it will fall back to the original DNS resolvers of the network. Otherwise, it will go with the DNS over its TPS from the trusted recursive resolvers. This approach was rolled out eventually in the US. Uh, Mozilla also opened some, uh, some feedback form. There were several discussions on that. Uh, but if we take it from the other side of the browser wars, and if we take it from the Google Chrome perspective, 
uh, Chrome actually deployed a different model. So what they did is they used this same provider auto upgrade. And what it means is that Google invited all the ISPs and the telcos to register an equivalence table, a table which states, hey, here is my DNS uh, 54, 53 IP address, and here is my DOH endpoint. So basically, each operator could register to this process, and when Chrome would start up, it would check, okay, hey, what is my DNS resolver? What resolver am I reaching right now? Is it in the table on the left? If yes, I will use the DOH endpoint on the, on the right. And this is how it went for a few years, but you know, when you have multiple solutions to a problem, we need to have some consensus, right? And uh, usually the role of this consensus uh, is coming for, uh, it's, it's time for IETF to find some standard. And um, there's quite an elegant one, uh, which is in draft and it's going to be released in the very near future. And this is RFC uh, 9462. Uh, what does this RFC do? Basically, we do what we know to do best. We ask the DNS resolvers. Yeah. So, uh, with this RFC, when a device is connecting to the network, it generates a very particular DNS query. Yeah, it asks for resolver.arpa with a query type SVCB. The resolver can reply to this query and it can say, hey, this are the encrypted versions of DNS that I am supporting. And when I'm saying encrypted versions of DNS, in this example, we see that this resolver supports uh, HTTPS, ALPN equals H2. Yeah, but in the very same way, the resolver can support TLS or it can support DNS over quick. Yeah. Great. So, uh, we have discussed, we have our resolvers, we have protected the last mile, the user to resolver communication. And now uh, we have also have uh, DNSSEC and have encrypted or protected, sorry, uh, the communication of resolver to authoritative. Is it all? Have we done everything we could for our users? Have we uh, protected them to the best extent possible? So. If you have been paying attention, we have been considering DNS as a protocol so far, right? But if we take a step back, actually DNS is not only a protocol, but it's also a service. It's a service that any device which connects to the network is utilizing, and it's also a service which is agnostic of the operating system, and also agnostic of the model of the devices. If a device is very, very old, it still uses DNS, right? So. Uh, this is a golden opportunity, I would say. This is an opportunity to bridge DNS with cybersecurity. Let's consider two facts. The first fact is that uh, there are right now approximately 15 billion connected devices. Yeah, This number is also going to go upwards, so the expectation is for this number to be 24 billion in the next two years. And there is another fact that 94% of the attacks rely on DNS at some point of the cyber kill chain. So at some point in some cyber attack, there is DNS being involved. And, okay, both numbers sound high. Um, have you seen some examples like the one on the top left? Have you received any, any email asking you to, uh, let's say, get something from a parcel company which you have never ordered or participate in some competition and win uh, free Air Serbia tickets. This was one very funny scam uh, circulating lately. So uh, what we can do on DNS is that at the moment that the user actually clicks on a malicious link, or if something is happening in the background and an application or a malicious process is communicating uh, to some malicious user, some malicious attacker, the DNS resolver, having some threat intelligence, is able to block this communication and is able to protect the users. So this notion of uh, DNS not only being a protocol, but actually being a security service, is called nowadays protective DNS. And with protective DNS, what we can do is we can significantly reduce 
the opportunities of the attackers, and we can block phishing, we can block malware communication, and we can cut down command and control channels. So, um, if we're speaking about enterprises, actually protective DNS has made it into the recommendations from the NSA and the NCSC. So in the US and the, the UK, all the organizations are encouraged to actually introduce some protective DNS service. Uh, but this is not only for these huge organizations, these corporations. This service is also for the end users. To give you some more examples, if I haven't persuaded you yet, uh, here in Serbia, we are cooperating with A1 Serbia with a product called A1 Net Protect and Telecom Serbia with a product called Siguranet. And in the last three months, we have actually blocked more than 200 million events. Yeah, these events, they are phishing, they are malware, they are command and control communication. And what we are actually seeing is a significant rise in the number of adware and malicious redirections happening on the Serbian internet. So what we see, they are scams similar to the Air Serbia from before, where the users are being prompted to click on phishing pages, and eventually they end up either being scammed and losing some financial uh, amount, or they are being prompted to download some malware unknowingly, and this malware actually is some coin miner, for example, or some uh, mobile Trojan. Now, somebody say, okay, um, I understand, I really don't like all these things, uh, so I will stay protected, I will use some, sorry, some feature phone. Yeah, this uh, phone will not connect to the internet, I will be safe. Most probably, yes, that's, that will be the case. Uh, however, there is some research and there are some indicators that even in this case, uh, actually, some devices have been compromised already from the manufacturer, and after they are activated, they are able to subscribe to premium services or they are able to exfiltrate information and send them back to the operators of this malicious network. Now, I will turn a bit the page and I will discuss a very interesting project we are working on. Uh, this project is called DNS for EU, and for anyone who hasn't heard it before, um, this is a short call from the uh, extract of proposals. DNS for EU is a project aiming to build a DNS resolution service uh, for the European Union, which aims to increase privacy and resiliency in the European Union. Now, uh, another parameter, another approach for this DNS for EU is that it should be able to protect the users against global cybersecurity threats, but also local and more specific targeted threats. Um, if we would like to get some requirements from while designing this product, and while designing this project. And this could also be considered like a blueprint of what is this protective DNS service. So uh, what we have is a large number of DNS resolvers being distributed all around the European Union and with a hard requirement of the resolvers operating in the European Union and from European data centers. The resolvers should be able to support all the latest standards. So we spoke about DNSSEC, we spoke about DNS over HTTPS, we spoke about DNS over TLS, and uh, also follow all the relevant regulations in the individual uh, countries. Last but not least, uh, the last layer is the protection against cyber threats. And in the next slide, I will show you exactly how we aim to do that. So the threat intelligence part this gathering the malicious domains part, is the core of the service. This part, for this part, we will be cooperating with the members of our consortium, and we will be gathering threat intelligence from the individual countries and from the individual computer emergency and response teams. Now, whenever some malicious domain is being identified, we will be immediately pushing it to the on-premise resolvers, which will be running either in the telcos, or in particular countries, in particular governments, or uh, even on our open public DNS resolvers. Sorry. Now, 
if I would like to see some high-level architecture of how we envision to build the project. So uh, there will be a unified DNS for EU cloud, which will have several dedicated Anycast IP addresses. The first IP address will be offering plain DNS resolution. The second IP address will be offering the security layer. And the third IP address will have the security layer plus some content filtering services. The IP is there, for example, obviously. Uh, at the same time, we will have local DNS for EU resolvers running from within the telco networks, and also local DNS for EU resolvers running for particular governments and for particular ministries. For example, there can be some very sensitive case where the data should not leave a particular ministry, for example, Ministry of Defense. And with that being said, I would like to summarize uh, today's presentation. So, we have seen how DNS has evolved from a product to a very versatile security offering, uh, which can help us improve resilience and also privacy. Uh, and how can DNS be very, very flexible in the deployment and operation options? It can be deployed not only on the cloud, it can be deployed also on premise, it can be deployed in multiple different scenarios. And I would like here to also make the argument that uh, protective DNS can actually augment the security of any network, uh, no matter how large or small or medium it is. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiriakou. As far as I see, there are no questions on YouTube chat. If you may have a question from the audience, Dr. Klaku, you have a question. Just hold your hand, we will be able to help you. Just a second. Donet ćemo vam mikrofon. Možda još jednom ruka samo, da vas lakše nađemo. Evo, izvolite. Kolegrice, možda bolje sa leve strane. Aha, ok. Thank you for that presentation. Desiree Željko Milošević, Internet Društvo Srbije. I would like to ask you a little bit about the fact that you mentioned filtering services. And at the same time, you said that you're going to improve privacy uh, just following probably GDPR standards. Are there any other standards that you follow? And in terms of filtering, it somehow is not in the nature of the DNS to do filtering on the level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And that's um, a, a very healthy question to have. So. Of course, we want to avoid any censorship scenarios, right? That's not the aim of the project. Um, I will tackle it into two parts. The first part is the regulations. So individual operators in the individual countries, they have different uh, regulator, uh, regulations they have to follow. So it can be GDPR or it can be some directives from the individual countries, right? For the scope of uh, DNS for EU, we, as the consortium, we will not be an operator, but we will be a service provider. So in the individual countries, we will have to follow different legislations, but this will not be on the main component of the service. This will be on the individual instances. Yeah. And the second part uh, related to filtering, um, it really comes down to uh, the choice of the users, right? So uh, if we go back, uh, to the individual scenarios. So in the very first scenario in the DNS for EU cloud, uh, what we see is that the users are, are free to opt into the service, right? We will not impose it to anyone. At the same time, the same applies for the individual uh, on-premise resolvers. So if, if such an instance will be running on the telco network, there will be an opt-in mode. So the users will have to actively subscribe to the service and enjoy the filtering. Okay, thank you. Uh, da li imamo još pitanja za gospodina Kiriakua? Any more questions? Aha, imamo. Još jedno pitanje. Just a follow-up question, if I may. Uh, and you will be providing this uh, filtering service and um, if, if you opt in for sin. So I just wonder on uh, which premises it's based and how does it work? Thank you. Uh, th thank you uh, also for the follow-up. Uh, basically, this DNS for EU project is being run by a consortium of members. So we are uh, 12 members from 13 countries, and the members of the consortium are, apart from Whalebone, several security emergency and response teams, and also ser uh, several academic entities. 
Yeah, so as a consortium, we will be building the threat intelligence based on what we know to be malicious from the individual countries, and we will aggregating all the information and pushing it to the individual resolvers. Thank you. That could be the Toto. Dali me još pitanja? No more questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiriakou. Molim vas jedan aplauz.